My name is Dave Hansen, and the title of my talk today is CubeSat Architecture for Reliable On-Orbit COTS Parts Use. I'm with Space Micro in San Diego, California. And here's the outline for my talk. COTS parts, or commercial off-the-shelf parts, have been growing in popularity for space use for quite some time. They come with a number of advantages and a number of disadvantages, and I'll be talking about that today. I'll start my talk today to discussing the threat from space radiation, and then talking about the response to that threat with either rad hard parts or commercial off-the-shelf parts. Finally, I'll be moving into a case study looking at our CubeSat space processor and a number of alternative approaches in the different subsystems within the CubeSat space processor and seeing what types of advantages and disadvantages those approaches bring. But first, I'd like to start my talk off by going back to 1941. The situation was that the Brooklyn Dodgers were playing baseball against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And with the score tied zero to zero in the fourth inning, the radio broadcast was lost for 15 minutes. A solar storm was affecting things and the, the, caused the broadcast to terminate in the middle of the game. When the broadcast finally resumed, the Pirates had four runs and eventually went on to win the game. Irate Brooklyn fans called up the radio called up the radio station to complain, but they found little satisfaction with the explanation that sunspots were to blame. If we move into the, the space age, we can see Telstar 1 was the first commercial satellite ever to fly. It was also the first satellite ever to fail due to radiation. Uh, looking at a couple others, we have the Hubble Space Telescope and Meteosat. Both of these are more recent satellites, and both of these satellites are able to recover from radiation effects because of architectural mitigation. All this is to say that radiation has been an issue for satellites for quite some time. More recently, we have data on CubeSats. This is from 2019 from Michael Swartlout at St. Louis University. And what we can see is that over here on this green and this yellow wedge are the successful CubeSat missions. This pink wedge is the unknown. And down here in the bottom right, we have the failures. Historically, CubeSats have had very high failure rates. And while not all of those failures are due to radiation, there needs to be a cost-effective radiation solution for CubeSats if they are to have reliable missions. So let's look a little bit more at the threat. What I have here on the left is a picture of the sun taken by the SOHO 195 angstrom imager. What you can see in the bottom right is a solar active area, and you can see the magnetic field lines around there with the particles causing the environment to glow. What you'll see is a bright white flash in here, and there it is. And right after that, the entire screen gets scratchy. You see a lot of pixels where you have uh, these scratch marks on it. Those, each of those scratches is a result of ejected ions from the sun, mostly protons in this case, and they go through and upset the individual pixels within the CCD. As you can imagine, if these particles have this type of effect on the CCD, they can cause all sorts of other problems on different types of satellite electronics. Now, the severity of the threat is not just a result of the particles from the sun, but there's also other sources. What I have here is a diagram of the Earth's trapped radiation belts. In the center, we have the Earth with these colorful lobes representing the electron radiation belts that are trapped as a result of the Earth's magnetic field. Here, just for scale purposes, is a dot representing the distance from Space Micro San Francisco. Uh, as I speak to you now, I'm in San Diego, and so that's a big chunk of the distance along the California coast. In here, we have the orbit of the International Space Station slightly closer, and you'll notice that it's right inside the belt so that the radiation environment there isn't quite as severe. Out here in the geosynchronous orbit, we have, the, we have orbits that are well beyond the extent of the, of the uh, trapped radiation belts. And in between, we have Galileo and GPS, the navigational satellites that are going through uh, the heart of the belts and facing the most severe part. To look at this a little bit more quantitatively, we can compare the effects due to heavy ions and protons. Um, and that's what I've done in these two plots. Over here on the right, we have the heavy ion effects. On the left, we have the proton effects. And each of these data series represents a different orbit. And along the horizontal axis, we have the inclination of the orbit. So over here, because we look at the heavy ions, we'll notice that the Leo orbits don't have quite as severe of a heavy ion effect as do the geo orbits. And of course, the vertical axis here represents a rate coefficient, which gives you some idea of how frequently we'll upset. The idea is that these LEO or these LEO satellites are going to have a lot more of the Earth's magnetic field between them and interstellar space. As a result, they provide a certain amount of natural shielding from galactic cosmic rays. That's not the case with geo. They're beyond the magnetic belts and they're facing the full extent of those galactic particles. Now, when we talk about protons, there's a little bit more going on. 
we can start here again about 500 kilometers, which would be the uh, space station orbit. And as we go into higher altitudes, into higher Leo orbits, we see that we're moving into the belts. And if we get to the high Leo or the low Mio orbits up here, what we have is our maximum, our maximum proton effects. Again, as those Mio orbits now go into higher and higher altitudes, you're moving to the edges and the proton effects are decreasing until eventually when you get out to a geo orbit, um, there's very few protons trapped around there at all. All this is to say is that when you talk about a Leo or a Mio orbit, you're typically dealing with protons, mostly protons, and these are more lightly ionizing. When you have a geo orbit, you're dealing with heavy ions, and those are more heavily ionizing and can cause a different type of effect. So with that said, let's take a moment to discuss different quality grades of parts. Over here on the left side of this, of this table, we have the different screening classes, like from commercial parts where they're just straight off the shelf, all the way up to QMLV space grade parts. What we see is that with quality and the reliability on these QMLV space grade parts, it's much higher. You have more screening, more testing done. Um, these are typically something where you would know uh, the, the activation energies for life tests, and they've been screened for radiation, among other things. And so these would be, have a much higher quality level. Now that is to say commercial parts don't have that, but that doesn't mean that they fail frequently. It just means that you have, you just don't have the screen that's applied to the commercial parts. Typically with your consumer electronics, you're high volumes. And so they got their processes well dialed in and have low failure rates. Now with radiation, QMLV parts are typically rad hard. Of course, with commercial parts, good luck. You get what you get and that's, you have to make do. But the advantages aren't all for the QML, the space grade parts. If you move over towards cost, capability, and availability, commercial parts look, start to look much more attractive. Again, commercial parts are much cheaper because of the less screening. And because they don't have to go through quite the rigorous screening process, you're able to have much more modern technologies compared to the old technologies used in those space grade parts. And finally, because of the high production rates for the commercial parts, their availability is much higher, very low lead times. Uh, in contrast with the space grade parts, you're talking about smaller volumes and the lead time to get the part is a lot longer. So with that said, you can see from this plot that there is quite a lot of reason to try to come up with architectural means to mitigate the radiation risks of these commercial parts. With that said, we move into the case study on the CubeSat space processor. And right here on the right of this slide, I have a block diagram. Uh, the space processor is a single board computer that has been developed under the Shrek program. Uh, it's based on the Xilinx Zinc FPGA, small form factor, 1U, and it's radiation tolerant. It has multiple systems in it, which lends itself towards multiple modes of hardening. And if you will, that's, this is sort of the outline for the rest of my talk. Uh, we'll start off talking specifically about flash memory and the different ways that we can go through and harden those devices. I've grouped in the DDR3. I won't be speaking about those specifically, but many of the issues are the same when you talk about a commercial DDR part and NAND part, at least in terms of radiation. Uh, from there, I'll go on and talk about briefly about the FPGAs and the means of hardening those um, and look at the different consequ consequences, what we're trading off in terms of cost and things like that as we make these different choices. And so we start off with memory. Now, memory, are typically subject to two different types of radiation errors. The first is bit errors. Um, and that actually is something that flash NAND that you're going to see terrestrially, where even if you're using a, a flash drive in your computer, the manufacturer will still recommend that you have some amount of error correction code in order to handle weak bits. Uh, it gets even worse though in space, you have weak bits resulting from total dose and single events. And these types of errors don't take a lot of charge to upset. And so they can be initiated by either protons or heavy ions. Now, from there, we could also have device level failures where it would be a complete functional interrupt of the chip or in some cases, a latch up or some other destructive effect. These tend to have require much more charge or a higher energy, linear energy transfer. And so typically require heavy ions to initiate those types of upsets. Now, that being said, you can see that if you are operating in a LEO or a MEO environment, maybe the device level failures aren't going to be as likely just because you have more protons there and fewer heavy ions. So as we go to our parts, we typically have two choices, the space grade parts or the unhardened parts. Now, the thing about space grade parts is that they are not inherently rad hard. 
There is no inherently rad hard modern memory. But instead, when you get a space grade memory, what you're typically getting is a commercial part that has been upscreened for space. What that means is you have about the same radiation, radiation performance, but with those space grade parts and the extra screening, your cost goes up by a factor of maybe 10 to 100. You also have about a two to 10 year capability lag. You're using older technologies. Whereas with the unhardened, unhardened parts, you are allowed to use just the latest and the greatest of things. And finally, it takes months maybe to get a space grade parts where you can get something that is unscreened and uh, commercial in just a matter of days. So there's quite a good reason to use these parts, these commercial parts. How do we deal with radiation? Well, the first one I've already alluded to, and that would be through an error correction code. Uh, with flash nan the manufacturer often recommends a bch error correction code and that ends up being very strong with a small amount of penalty so with bch you have about a 95 percent of your memory density is actually used for data your upset rate is better by a factor of 10 to the 8th but unfortunately you'll still have the same device level effects now if you're in an environment where you don't have those more highly ionizing particles maybe the device level effects aren't as important and you can get away with that type of architecture on the other hand, if you want to deal with those device level effects and protect your system, you might try something like TMR. But this one is actually a little bit tricky because now you have to have three die and a single voter, and then you lose a third, and your memory density is a third of what you actually have to put on the board. Your upset rate improves by a factor of about 10 to the fifth, but what's interesting is that just a simple TMR by itself will end up giving you similar device level effects. The problem here is that once one of these die uh, has a, a functional interrupt or a destructive event, there's enough bitters in the other two that you're eventually going to pass those through to your system and it can cause problems. So to really come up with a very rad hard or bulletproof part, you have to layer your hardening. So you would use something like this, where you have a TMR and an ECC in combination. Now, again, you have the one third memory density because you have three die and they're going to be voted. So you're only actually using one third of the memory that uh, you get to that you only have access to use a third of the memory density that you're putting on your board, but you do again get those high um, correction rates. So you have a factor of 10 to the eighth better in terms of upset rate because of the error correction code. On top of that, because you, when one of these dies fails, you can still correct the errors in the other two, you'll now see a 10 to the sixth factor better in terms of device level effects. So the penalty you pay is that you have to have use more area and more computing power. But if you're in a situation where you need something that's more reliable, maybe that would be a good trade. So that leads us to FPGAs. Now, unlike the case with memory, the FPGAs, you actually have the option of buying a rad hard part. Up here in this table on the upper right, what I've got is a number of different Xilinx parts. The Vertex 5Q is the rad hard part. And as you can see, it is much better in terms of its radiation performance. A factor of a thousand relative to the Vertex 2. But what you're paying for there is that you're using a much older technology, 65 nanometer versus one of these 20-ish nanometer parts for the, for the Vertex 7 or the ultra scale. So again, you don't have the latest and the greatest here. When you come down and you compare these parts, if you've got a space grade ruggedized part, you can actually get up to a mega rad, which is a very high total dose, and you're completely latch-up free. In comparison, the unhardened parts maybe get you to 30K rad, and you will see latch-ups at a fairly low and your energy transfer are about 15. The cost, again, you're looking about 10 to 100 times more for old technology, and you're sacrificing the quality of your tools when you get the space grade parts, as well as needing a much longer lead time to get those parts. But you do have that choice between the commercial parts and the rad hard version. Now, to harden those commercial parts, there's a number of different things that you can do. The first would be internal TMR over here on the left, I have the um, resource usage for an unmitigated layout and a TMR layout. As you can see, there's quite a bit more of the fabric that's used in this TMR layout. And again, you have a 3x resource penalty if you're going to internally TMR or triple, triple mode redundant, make a triple mode redundant design. What that gets you is about 100x better upset rate, but it does not protect you against device level effects. Now, you can also use scrubbing where you go through and you clean out the memory periodically. One of the interesting features about this is that as you decrease your scrub time, you end up increasing your mean time to failure and improving your reliability. 
What this means is that you can trade off your upset rate that's acceptable for the dead time that you can deal with. It's a tunable hardness. But again, it does not offer any sort of device level mitigation. But these do provide internal ways to, to improve what types of upset rates you have. Now, to deal with the device level effects, however, we can look to our get out of jail free card or the watchdog timer. And you can see that over here in the block diagram as this green block here. What the, we've done with this is at Space Micro, we have a patented uh, watchdog timer that we use on our version of the CSP. And it's external to the FPGA and it monitors the FPGA for correct function. Whenever the FPGA goes down, then it resets the processor and allows it to return to an operational state. This watchdog timer is built with rad hard parts, but because the circuitry is simple and because it's much smaller, we can have rad hard parts with a very high radiation tolerance, but we can build that and, and have a much cheaper uh, rad hard version. So essentially what we've done is we've outsourced the FPGA hardness to external circuitry. And because we've done it that way, we can do it much more cheaply. So with that said, the CubeSat space processor provides a nice case study on how to apply architectural hardening to satellite electronics. Uh, now, of course, the best option in terms of how you harden your satellite electronics is going to depend on a number of different things. You have to always look at the environment and you also have to look at what type of penalties you're willing to pay. But once you do understand that, there are a number of different tools that you have, whether that's error correction codes, triple mode redundancy, and the scrubbing and watchdog timer, which uh, are also provide means of, of correcting radiation events. So with that said, I thank you for your time. I appreciate you spending the time to listen this far. And I also want to mention that at Space Micro, we are hiring if you're in the market for a job, if your student is going to be graduating sometime soon, we'd love to hear from you. And you can get my information from the program. Thank you very much.